The call that I received was not the call that I wanted. Several days before the phone call, it changed my life arrived. I had left my father in the care of my son and had developed a wonderful plan for how we were going to take care of my parents in the transition time of their moving from their home in Atlanta here into coastal Georgia. My son had graciously agreed to take leave from Fort Benning and my daughter was soon to come as well from her home in Birmingham and then I would return several days later. My mother had turned suddenly ill in the midst of this move and transition and was hospitalized with double pneumonia in the intensive care unit. Now the episodes leading to my parents coming to live with me, there was a great deal of trauma and difficulty and pain that they had endured, but it seemed as if we had turned the tide. Their condominium had at last sold at a price that they were happy with, and the movers were going to be there in just several days. And then, as I stated, my mother turned ill, and my father's depression, which had been incredibly significant in the first place, continued to escalate beyond what we knew what to do. And the phone call that I received on January the 13th of 2016 was, Dad, I'm sorry. I could hear in the tone of my son's voice that something was wrong. And what I wanted to hear him say was, Dad, Papa fell and he's hurt and we're going to take him to the hospital. I'm sorry. But what he said is, Dad, I'm sorry. Papa's dead. My father had died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Now, this was not a man that anyone would have ever, experienced, ever expected something of this nature to occur. Sometimes when we think about suicide, we may think about the drug addicted, or we may think about the weak-willed, or the cele flamboyant celebrity, or the rock star, whatever the case may be. None encompassed my dad. My father was my hero. He was my mentor. He was the man who was always there for me during those turbulent years of adolescence when I was constantly getting in trouble and even through adulthood when I had made some difficult choices, mom and dad were always there and I thought at last I was going to be able to be there for him. This was the man who was the 1960 Marine recruit at Paris Island, South Carolina, the man who had literally climbed his way to corporate success by climbing telephone poles with only a high school diploma and working his way into middle management so that he was teaching classes with individuals who often had master's and graduate level degrees. This was an incredibly successful man. A man who had taken retirement after 30 years of service and more or less volunteered his service as a police chaplain for many years and made a profound difference in the lives of police officers and prisoners and so many people who knew and loved him. But in the final phases of his life and what we may now call geriatric, geriatric depression, it was not enough. And my mentor and my hero was dead. The gamut of emotions that ran my life in the months ahead escalated from the pain of intense loss to feelings of abandonment, feelings of betrayal, feelings of anger, but ultimately feelings of prolific and amazing love. The transition in that time was one of the most difficult periods of my life. In some ways, nothing could have ever prepared me for that moment. And in other ways, there was this synchronicity of life as if everything that had ever happened had prepared me for that moment. One of the great lessons I had to learn in that time was that my emotions could not be a determinant of my life. They were just an indicator of what I was feeling. There was still so much to do. And beyond coping with my father's death, the most difficult moment of my life was to have to look at my mother's eyes every day in a hospital room when she had a respirator down her throat and could not talk to me and had that questioning look of where's daddy and not to be able to tell him that he was dead until a week after he had passed away. But somehow I found that inner strength. It was the faith. It was the support of some wonderful people. 
I found out that my own kids, Trisha and Tyler, were no longer just a little boy and a little girl, but they had truly become young men and young women, and their support gave me so much strength and so much hope. And I chose that rather than to mourn how my father had passed away, I was going to celebrate how he had lived his life and the great lessons that he had taught to me. There were still so many responsibilities and items that needed to be addressed. And even in spite of that, after mom and I made that 300-mile pilgrimage from Atlanta back down here to the coast, I, I decided to go back to work almost immediately. Now again, my emotions were more or less fixated on depression. I did not want to get out of the bed. I did not want to face life. I did not want to encounter any of these difficulties. There was still a memorial service to plan. There was still so much to do, but I chose to live by my choices rather than my emotions. And I thought that one of the reasons that I was returning to work in the high school that I was teaching at at that time was because I knew that my students needed me. Exams were soon to come from the state, and there were things that needed to be done. But what I didn't realize was, maybe they did need me, but I needed them. And I was able to draw from their strength and their love and their support as well. Even though many of them may not have even known exactly why I was absent, I'm not sure. Now, one of the great surprises in dealing with all this was how adults respond to the suicide. Today, we find it very easy to talk about suicide prevention and suicide intervention. But what happens after someone dies? There was a surprising silence. Now, as we sit here this afternoon, if statistics bear out, and I would hope they wouldn't, but they probably will, 122 people in the United States will take their lives. Multiply that times 10, times 20, times 30. All of the people who know those individuals, who love them, who are suffering with that loss, and how do they cope? One of the most surprising aspects of this was how adults did choose. Many of them said nothing to me at all. Now, many of them were absolutely wonderful, but many of them did not say anything to me, especially when I, when I returned to work. And there was a moment where that was an affront to me, and I took that as an offense. And I realized it wasn't that they didn't want to say anything. It was that they did not know what to say. But my students were the ones who presented me with a card and presented me with the encouragement and the support. I learned something very important in the 12-step movement many years ago that gave me a support through all this. First things first, and one day at a time. And I lived my life one day at a time, celebrating my father's life and offering to others the hope and healing of surviving the suicide of someone that you love. Thank you.